Before we begin, I wanted to give a huge shout out to the folks at Amazon Music for partnering with us on this episode of the Inside Line F1 podcast. But more on this later. Right then, let's get right into today's episode. said Max Verstappen winning can become boring. The 2024 Saudi Arabian GP was hardly boring. I mean, if anything, we had so many micro stories in the middle of the race. Oliver Behrman finishing 7th on his debut as an 18-year-old for Ferrari. How crazy is that? Oscar Piastri making a McLaren home in P4 and Charles Leclerc winning in F1.5. Isn't that the sign of a great race? But best of all, we also got to see two incredible standout performances. Firstly, one from Lance Stroll, kissing the barrier and bringing his car to the wall. Classic, timeless, ageless, that's what you call that. And also, one from Kevin Magnussen, timeless as well, because he was absolutely either brave or either stupid, depending on whether you're a Haas fan or you're not a Haas fan. I mean, so many things happening, Kunal. And upon that, we also had the stewards chipping in to add some drama as well. Nobody can actually say that the 2024 Saudi Arabian Grand Prix was boring. Hardly. Hardly. Absolutely. I think Saturday racing anyway is more exciting, like I've been saying. But yeah, overall, there was a sense of a lot of action happening for once. Somil, this is the kind of racing that I'm a bit of a fan of, that there are attacks and there are defenses, not just plain DRS enabled overtakes. Yes. PS3 chasing Hamilton and everyone else in, you know, then Hamilton chasing Lando Norris. Uh, no overtakes that happened there. And there is a data-driven reason for that, which we'll get to. But that's what overtaking is all about. It's about the battles and not just the action of overtake itself. And we also saw Oliver Behrman make some really good overtakes. We also saw Alex Albon try to go around the outside of a couple of drivers thrice on the bank turn. We also got to see so much chaos with Yuki Tsunoda and Magnussen. It's like... There's so much of racing packed in that if you don't enjoy a race like this, I think you're probably not a racing fan. You're more of a fan of a certain driver. And I'll tell you what, let's start with the driver that people will be most uh, disappointed with all the way through. We, we need to talk about, very firstly, what happened with Carlos Sainz? Because I need to get it out of the window before we discuss the star performer. Appendicitis, bit of a shame that he's not there. But that means, Kunal... We got to see a kid debut with Ferrari. And I know that stat has been popularized everywhere now. But first time since, what, 1972? It's ridiculous. And he was so good. That's even before my time, which is which is <laughs> great. And it's, you know, appendicitis. I think second time in three years, we've actually had a driver being replaced at a Grand Prix weekend with appendicitis. Alexander Albon mm. was the first one. Uh, who had it in the in the recent times uh, with Williams? We saw Nick DeFries come in, score a point. We've seen similar history repeat. Oliver Behrman came in and then he scored a point as well. So standout performer. Another standout performer actually is not from Formula One. It's from Formula Two. The the Norwegian driver Dennis Hauger at turn twenty seven, last corner of the last lap, Sommel he overtakes two cars Whoa. in the run down to the finish line it was incredible so you know i think formula 2 race was actually a lot more fun than formula 1 this weekend yet again i would say and of course our our own kush maini scored his best result in formula 2 he got pole finally the first ever indian to get pole position in the history of formula 2 and then he scored a second place after a rocket ship start that he had but a lot of things to talk about already. Haven't we just literally <laughs> thrown all the things on the table? We have, we have. Let's discuss them in greater depth. But folks, let's tell you who we are. We are the Inside Line F1 podcast. We've been doing this for the last 11 years and are one of the top five most listened to podcasts in the world in terms of Formula One and in the top 0.5% of all podcasts on Spotify as well. My name is Somal Arora. I am the host of the Indian Racing League the MotoGP Indian Grand Prix, and also the Indian Supercross Racing League, among many other things. And the other voice that you heard on the podcast was, of course, Kunal Shah, the former marketing head of the Force India Formula 1 team, who is currently an F1 consultant for the Viaplay Group in Norway. 
Well, Kunal, let's get down into it. Star performers, let's talk about them. I think we can't go beyond Oliver Behrman, firstly. Let's just put the enormity of his achievement into context. For an 18-year-old to be, firstly, physically ready to drive a Formula 1 car is insane. I think it shows you the amount of preparation that every reserve driver also has to do, even though they'll probably not drive the car ever. So that's one amazing thing. But secondly, the mental composure to be A, complaining about Nico Hulkenberg in the middle of the race, B, saying that the other drivers are too slow, and C, to be so calm at the end of the race and to not shed a tear and to say, well, good job, guys, really professional, well done, nicely done, and to carry on, even though Ferrari were treating him like a kid. That tells you so much about how he might just be 18, but in terms of driving a car, I mean, he's probably driving it like a 27-year-old. Yeah, you know, he, he seemed like he knew what he was doing. He seemed like uh, in control of everything in the car, physically, mentally, and emotionally, like you pointed out. I believe, uh, you know, he's this race was a great advertisement for Oliver Behrman's uh, candidature as, as a Formula One driver in 2025. And, you know, truth be told, he was quick. And we can we can actually uh, uh, you know we can actually discuss how his weekend should be measured. So come qualifying, can he get out of Q one? And he did. What was his gap to Charles Leclerc? And it was about three tenths, if I remember, which is really good for a street circuit uh, as as we have in Jeddah, right? And then uh, he also didn't make it to Q three. But what was his gap? It was less than half a tenth. Imagine if he got into Q three. The 2025 Ferrari driver, Lewis Hamilton, would have been knocked out of Q3. So he almost just made headlines there. Again, in the race uh, and in qualifying, he didn't crash, which I think is fantastic. Then Sommel, like you pointed out, he pulled off a lot of overtakes, rightfully got voted as a driver of the day, but crucially picked up six points in his Formula One debut. In a few moments from now, why don't we discuss all the drivers who may not even score six points to beat Oliver Behrman <laughs> in 2024? Yeah, uh, for once, Kevin Magnussen might be there. The Williams drivers, maybe Logan, uh, maybe not Alex Albon. Uh, Haas in general are going to be in a struggle. Forget about Alfa Romeo anyway. Uh, and, and also, so many other drivers were in that list. But crucially, the fun stat is he's actually scored more points in Formula 1 than he has in his day championship of Formula 2, believe it or not. That's that's kind of ridiculous how it's working out. And I like that. I, I like that uh, there are more kids who are ready to get going. And I just get a feeling, I don't know, I, I'm just speaking hypothetically here. Don't count me out on this one or, or don't take this too seriously. But wouldn't it be nice to just have one rookie per team every year, race in one race of the season? Like Just like a wild card, maybe not replacing one of the existing drivers, but I don't know. Just hypothetically, a third car, just for a rookie. Let's see what they've got. And that'll keep on the volatility. We may not need, we might not need a new team. Just that one story is so good enough to spice up a race, like we had with DeVries back in Monza a couple of years ago as well. It's just nice to see future talents pop up and sometimes school other ones who have been around for so long. I think that might just happen if we have, you know, more than 25 races on the calendar. We're talking of circuit rotations and literally in Saudi Arabia, the drivers were asked if there should be driver rotations, you know. So you as a driver pick, you know, 25 races, which you will participate in. And for the other five races, okay, uh, you know, we should just have driver rotations. But either way, that's for another day. But I'm going to also be a little critical here. Okay, uh, because are the cars too easy to jump into and just drive? That's something David Coulthard points out each time when he sees a rookie just jump in, be on the pace, be fit enough. And he would say back in our time, it didn't matter who the rookie was, but you would struggle more than you would succeed, right? But that's just a question that we probably don't need to ponder on. Or maybe you have a view, Samal? Yeah, I, I, uh, again, I call bullshit on that. It's just that drivers these days are so much more prepared because they're doing proper programs with Formula One teams where they are monitoring their diet, their fitness, their workouts, simulator sessions every single day. And now that there's a clearer path on how to become a Formula 1 driver, naturally more people will be closer to being a Formula 1 driver than in the past because back in the day it was just, okay, are you good enough? Can you drive? Go in there. Even if you smoke, even if you can't run 10 kilometers, just figure it out and drive. So I think, I I got bullshit on that for DC. I don't know. Maybe it's just uh, 
I, I, we don't have to pick beef with him because he's uh, he's a very esteemed guest of the podcast. But a bit of ego talking, perhaps. I don't know. Yeah, or maybe maybe I'm sure there's some perspective because DC also said, you know, Fernando wanting to race till 50 is another proof that these cars, these cars, the modern day cars, aren't as physically, uh, you know, uh, difficult to drive as the cars were back in his time. But you can take that up whenever you have DC <laughs> next on the podcast. You can ask him what he means. He's I always remember DC as one of those drivers who had the widest neck in the history of Formula One, right? Even even wider than I would say in Michael Schumacher. But why don't we why don't we move on? So Oliver Behrman, just one 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 more thing actually, since I said move on, right? Two very funny things. There are three Ferrari drivers now in the top ten in the drivers' championship. Leclerc Sainz and Oliver Behrman, right? And the second, which is a bit of a pity, is Pierre Gasly is 21st in a 20 driver championship. That's painful for a driver like Pierre Gasly. He's he's done literally nothing to deserve what he's getting this year with Alpine and to be 21st in a 20 driver championship. Unfortunately, the team haven't done anything at all to change that. So that's also a bit of a bubble. No, but no, no, they had I a mean, new restructure. They, they had a restructure. So they are doing something all the time <laughs> with the number of people who they can keep moving and shuffling around and shuffle around even more. I mean, Gasly couldn't even start the race. That's how yeah. that's how terrible it's it's been for them, you know. It, and I think I think the only driver who couldn't start a race in Saudi Arabia, and again in recent times where you just have an issue the minute you crank up the car, was Yuki Sonoda in 2021 at Saudi mm-hmm. Arabia as well. But either way, that's that's for another stat. Do we have another hero? Because I definitely do. We do. Yes. Uh, okay. Are we talking about the good hero? Or the bad hero. Because in Hindi, of course, hero also means someone who's stupid. Like, hey, don't try to be a hero. So, are we talking about the FIA or Kevin Magnussen? Because I'm sort of confused here. Who do we talk about first? I think I'm going to go with Kevin Magnussen. For all the Viking love I get from the Viking (laughs) lands out here. Kevin Magnussen. My goodness. What an aggressive driver. But all for a good effect. Thanks to his heroics. uh, You know, Nico Hulkenberg could score a point for 10th place in the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix. Doesn't matter that he was, you know, a minute and whatever down. Just the fact that Haas became the sixth team to score a point only in the second race of the season. Because in Bahrain, only the top five teams, the fastest five teams scored. And that typically looks to be the norm, right? If all the five teams keep scoring. But Kevin Magnussen helped Haas to become that sixth team. Incredible stuff. Of course, he picked up what? 22nd time penalties on the way? Yeah. But did he know is my main question. Because in the middle of the race, right, and this is a discussion that DC was having himself on the F1 TV broadcast, that it would be stupid for him to be driving the way he was driving if he knew. Because that's technically on the boundary lines of uh, disrespecting the space of other drivers and being too aggressive. But the thing is, the way Haas was speaking to him, it seemed like he was doing the team a favor knowing that he had a penalty. And if that's the case, I think that makes it even more heroic considering how aggressive he was and how much he had his elbows out. You were on the broadcast, right? You had all the access to the footage. Did he know that he had a penalty, Kunal? Yes, he very much did know that he had a penalty. In fact, in his post-race statement, he also turned around and said, after I had my penalties, I knew I had no chance. So I decided to give Nico all the chance I could. And I think I think it's just just classic teamwork, you know, in action. And teams like Haas, this is what they need, especially with the turbulent stories around them. Pretty much nobody wants them on the grid. Everyone wants them to sell away to Andretti. And this whole team principle change they've had with Komatsu and with Gunther Steiner. This is great uh, showing that hey, we can actually uh, you know fight for our day when when it when the time comes. And let's remember this is a circuit Haas has scored at before. So there is precedence in Haas's actions and result as well. But great stuff with Kevin Magnussen. And now that you turned around and said the FIA, why don't we just jump straight in? Because the FIA gave him two 10 second time penalties. And I think this is where uh, the change in rule has happened. A five-second time penalty is actually changed into a 10-second time penalty from 2024, much to the dismay of the drivers and my own dismay as well. I just think a 10-second time penalty is too much, okay? But let's put this into perspective. Kevin Magnussen overtook Yuki Sonoda off track. He didn't relinquish track position to Sonoda. He took the penalty, okay? 
But then what happened is actually it should have been Sonoda who should have finished in the top 10, who it could have been had it not been for that illegal overtake off track. So understandably, Sonoda and Racing Bulls are extremely pissed off with that penalty and the way Kevin Magnussen took position. Fair enough. Absolutely fair on their point. And if you look at the bigger picture about why they didn't score points, I think it comes down to that eventually and being stuck behind Magnussen for so long. Had they had the chance to get past early on, Yuki would have been in a far healthier place and so on and so forth. But we can't analyze that too much. What we can analyze is the stupidity of giving a 10-second penalty when you could have simply said, Kevin, relinquish the position. And also, 10 seconds for leaving the track and gaining an advantage in a second case? Bullshit. Honestly, sorry if I'm being too aggressive. But you look at that, uh, you look at that replay and clearly, he's gained what? One second at the most? Two at best? Give it a five-second penalty just so that you want to expose or rather impose an example on it. Ten seconds for that minor corner cut, Kunal, is just too much. It's, it's like they that, weren't even thinking. But th- that's what I'm saying. You know, there is no longer a five-second time penalty. It is but, only I mean, a ten-second time but, penalty. But, but th- that's what they want to do. They want to make it. They want to make it even more tough for drivers to cut corners like that because five seconds was making no difference. So there you go. You get actually a 10 second penalty. So you gain a second or two, but should you be doing that? Right. And, and, and to, to put it into perspective, the FIA is not going to be there to tell the teams and drivers, you need to relinquish position. What they are there to see if the teams do it by themselves. Okay. And Haas chose to not do it, which is why Kevin Magnussen ended up getting the penalty. But if I was Haas, I wouldn't do it as well because I've only scored, what, three to six points in the entirety of last year. I'm getting the chance to score one critical point. I'm not letting go of any position unless you tell me to. So that's that's fair on their part. Yeah, and that, 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 exactly. I mean, the Haas played. They said, you know what? With one driver, we can take as many time penalties as we want. So long as with the other driver, we are scoring a point. It doesn't matter. And this is what Lauro Makis has been pointing out post-race. He's livid at how Magnussen was, you know, given as many time. I mean, Magnussen could have had a five-minute time penalty. Okay. Didn't, wouldn't have mattered. But anyway. Exactly. But, but yeah. An, an, another thing which is extremely exciting about the FIA. And what's your Hang on. assessment of this? Did you Lando say, Norris. Oh. Sorry, did you say exciting with the FIA? Yeah. Yeah, exciting with the FIA of outside of the MBS gate. Okay. But what's your take on Lando Norris? Did he have a jump start? Yes or no? <laughs> okay. So my opinion does yes not matter. Or no. My opinion does not matter because I am not a transponder. Funny, right? Yeah, yeah. You should go on and explain that. So according to the FIA, and this is something that's also happened with Sebastian Vettel in Suzuka 2019. They only register a jump start if the transponder registers a jump start. And according to the FIA, the transponder of Lando Norris at the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix did not register a jump start, even though all of our eyes, which are extremely, uh, I think, what, 8K vision, so many megapixels, a lot of processing power with an M16 chip that our brain is, we could all see through a million camera angles that he had jumped the start. He might not have gained an advantage, but a rule is a rule. But I don't get this one thing. Sure, the transponder did not give him a jump start, but why? That clarification hasn't been made yet. Why did it not record a jump start? When does it record a jump start? And that's that's, that's like a bit that's a bit grey, right? That you could technically jump a start, and if the transponder doesn't give you out, you're not out. But why does it not give you out? Is the whole question. That's wonderfully summarized, and I think I think this is where the error margin comes in. You know, plus minus five percent or whatever the margin of the sensor works in. So that's probably what has happened, and it's unfortunate because back in time, I always remember it was with the naked eye itself. You know, jump starts were very common in the earlier eras of Formula One. I mean, as uh, as much as maybe you know, ten or fifteen years ago, I've seen you know cars and drivers being pulled up for jump starts. Mm. George Russell could see it; who was right in the next grid box. So maybe this is an area where they'll have to tighten their uh, you know sensors, bring in more AI, or just get the human naked eye to do it anyway. And the other counter explanation, which you know, hopefully we get before Australia is. Maybe maybe Norris moved within his box itself. Maybe the movement was so little. Uh, you know, although there are images floating around on social media showing that his tires were over the line. Any case, but 
another controversy that the FIA has to address. Luckily, this is a good on-track one, which can be assessed and explained rather than yeah. why did the president take a private jet to fly around the world, I guess. <laughs> but wait, on the whole canal, how would you rate the FIA's performance this weekend? I can't believe we're talking about this before we're talking about Max Verstappen, but such is the case of the sport. But how would you rate it? Do, do you think they were fair all the way through the weekend? It all depends because this was another race weekend where a drain cover came undone. Okay, mm. so in the last four races, three races have had drain cover issues. Las Vegas, Bahrain, and Saudi Arabia, or race venues, right? Just so that I'm being more specific before people point out that Bahrain's issues were in testing and not during the race, blah, blah, blah. I think the FI were fairly average. You know, they were... They were just the usual, inconsistent and unpredictable, if that's that's the word. And again, I mean, uh, you know, even if you go back to Formula 2, they had lots of disqualifications they could give out. The winner of the sprint race was disqualified and, and so on. So, so and so, pretty average. Nothing nothing uh, like the FI as we've known of the past, uh, I would say, maybe of the of the Jean Todd era where they just looked a lot more sharper, although the rule... Uh, book hasn't really changed. Maybe the way of execution has changed. Maybe there's no interference uh, back then. Yep, could be, could be. But that's the FIA. We need to talk about a lot more things as well. Let's just begin with Max, shall we? I think that'll be good. 56 race wins. That puts him a couple ahead of Sebastian Vettel. He is, now- is it 56 or 55? I have lost count now. So <laughs> 56 is what uh, my numbers say again. But... It's too much. It's far too much. Three more than Sebastian Vettel, 56 is the number. And the margins just keep on getting bigger. The way he controls the race keeps on getting better. Nine consecutive race wins for the second time in his career. Oh, man. Uh, what do you say now? What do you say? He's he's going to equal his longest race winning streak next weekend. Or rather, the next race, I would say. Uh, and... 100th podium, all in Red Bull racing cars, as Christian Horner keeps, you know, reminding him, I would say. Um, never before has Max Verstappen actually won the previous two opening rounds of a Grand Prix season. That's another one. And then um, Max Verstappen has now led the Drivers' Championship for 41 races on the trot. Oh, God. And, uh, yeah, that's that's one that I got. And... Max Verstappen will actually go to Australia, which is the next round, not having retired from any race for the last two years. Oh, God. And Yikes. his qualifying margin was bloody long. Three and a half or tenths is fantastic. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, yeah. yeah. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, that's your Formula One podcast done. Let's talk about Formula 1.5. Oh, God. <laughs> the guy's good, huh? Excuse me. The guy's guy so good. I mean, we saw at the end of the race the gap decreasing. But I, I want to analyze one word that the Red Bull team mentioned at the end. And they said, well-controlled, Max. It's not that he doesn't make mistakes. It's just that the mistakes are so fine that the rest of the world doesn't even notice them. And that's a different form of greatness, right? Where... Your mistakes are probably where most drivers find their greatness to end. That's that's so good. Sergio couldn't even match him this weekend, even though he had actually what I'd say would be his best weekend in ages, to be honest. Yeah, and you know, he loves this circuit. I think maybe Checo just realizes it's not too bad if he consistently delivers to what the second best driver in the world is expected to deliver, yeah. right? And that's probably good for his mental well-being as well and Gives him a better shot for 2025 rather than trying to be a hero and then become a zero in 2024 uh, like he did in 2023 as well. And then I think uh, the question that I'm also eager to ask is we've now seen two different types of circuits and Red Bull are far ahead. Ferrari is also seemingly a little more ahead of McLaren and Mercedes, right? Could it be that, you know, two Red Bull drivers and and the Ferrari drivers keep blocking up the podium for many races in the first uh, first part, first third of the season, while others keep bringing upgrades and so on. Because Leclerc was there in P3. I'm pretty sure if Carlos Sainz was racing, he would have been slightly up there as well. 
And uh, the gaps between Red Bull and the rest is phenomenal. I think it's a 40 second to McLaren and Mercedes. But good old uh, partners and team uh, team owners or co-owners, you know, McLaren and Mercedes, they entertained us, right? Sommel, you know, with, mm. with their on-track uh, skirmishes, I would say. Oscar Piastri, like you said, in fourth place, uh, was chasing down Lewis Hamilton. And very interestingly, Lewis actually was asked post-race, Lewis... How are you feeling after the race? He literally looks at Mervi. She's a wire play Finland reporter. He's like, I finished ninth in the race. That was his answer, right? Yeah. Uh, and I think that's a bit of a, you know, bit of a show of just how tough it is. Because Mercedes prioritized straight line speed in Saudi Arabia. That's why they were struggling to the high speed bends, right? They expected <laughs> the straight line speeds to help them move up in the race. McLaren was actually the opposite. They had high-speed bend performance, but not straight-line speed. So two very opposite setup cars were battling on track. But guess what won in the end? Track position. Because that's yeah. how closely matched those two packages are. Doesn't matter what setup you take. Just matters if you're the car ahead, you will be able to stay ahead. And that's what actually happened with McLaren and with Mercedes. And that's fine. That's okay. You don't need a million overtakes to make a race good. You just need two teams. Excuse me. You just need two cars with opposite ways. I mean, rather, all you need is two different cars with two different styles of driving. One might be good on the straights. One might be good on the corners. Replicate this amongst cars, bikes, trucks, whatever. If there is a car that's faster on the straights and there's a car that's faster on the corners... Put them together. That's it. That's what makes for a good motor race. And we got that. That's all. It's 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 brilliant. And there's so there were so many attempts from Oscar Piastri to pass Lewis Hamilton. Didn't work out because McLaren barely had any straight line speed. Uh, there were so many attempts from Lewis Hamilton that also didn't quite work out because there was just not enough track position. And that's all right. I think we need to write a letter to the FIA and Formula One saying this is good. There's no need to. Uh, there's no need to increase the number of overtakes with some artificial measures like DRS. Just make sure that we have this and we'll be fine. Absolutely. I mean, following is what we need. We need the battles. We don't want them to increase DRS by 20 meters just so that, hey, Lando Norris could have actually made the overtake on whoever he was battling and wherever he was battling, right? Because that's what we don't want, like you're trying to you know, nicely point out. And another very interesting thing, PS3 outqualified Lando Norris, George Russell for the third consecutive race outqualified Lewis Hamilton. Mm -hmm. But guess also how this benefited them. In the top 10, there were the two drivers that actually didn't pit under the safety car, which your good friend Lance Stroll brought out. We'll talk about Lance Stroll in a bit, right? Uh, But what happened is because they were also, uh, you know, they they were outqualified and, uh, outqualified and on track in the race, their, their teammates were up ahead of them. The teammates got the regular preferential strategy. Norris and Hamilton were put on the alternate strategy just to split the team's fortunes should a late race safety car have come out, right? And that's why Norris and Hamilton uh, ran very high up in the front, but then couldn't end up doing anything on their soft tires, right? Because they started battling each other and, you know, Oliver Behrman still had reserve in the medium. Can you imagine Lando Norris and Lewis Hamilton were actually put on the alternate strategy? Hmm. When last did we actually hear and see that happen? That's how strong Piastri and Russell have become this season. Yeah. And some might say that Oscar Piastri has a few rough edges left because he couldn't quite make those overtakes work out on Lewis Hamilton. But... I say, just look at the way the car was driving. Look at the way they were struggling in the straight line. He was frustrated. I mean, think about it. If you're trying to break a wall after 25 consecutive chances, and there's one chance where you feel like, ah, I might just be able to do it, and you slam harder than you ever can, and it still doesn't happen, of course you'll be frustrated. That's what we could see with Oscar Piastri. It's only human. I think the same could have been said about Lewis Hamilton if he was in the same case as well, right? So it's, it's good to see drivers fighting. And that's nice for for one bit. But on the other hand, it's also... Yeah. You're saying? Yeah, yeah, go on, go on. Uh, no, go on. I was, I was actually bringing up Lance Stroll, but I think we can push yeah, before, it back okay, as much then as before, we can. Be, we don't need to. Before you, bring, <laughs> be, before you bring up Lance Stroll, a question that I have to ask you and everyone who's listening. Do you believe Mercedes has actually gone backwards after you know their P2 finish last year? 
No. I mean, you still think they're the second fastest team? They're just, you're, you're acting like Toto Wolf. We've got a really fast car. We just have to understand it and unlock more pace. <laughs> but I think, I think Mercedes is third or fourth fastest at best. They're no longer the second fastest. You know, Ferrari has sort of taken that leap yeah. forward. But were they second fastest convincingly ever last year? Because I remember Ferrari also. I think it's, yeah, Ferrari have taken a step ahead. You're right. Yeah. But it's, it's, I, I like how there's a there's such closeness between Mercedes and McLaren that it doesn't matter anymore because we're getting to see a fight. And on the other hand, we're also getting to see Aston Martin be closer, which is nice as well, right? And, and I'd love to know your take on this as well. How do you interpret their performance this weekend? Because on one side, we had a great artist teaching us how to crash, which was incredible. But on the other hand, Fernando Alonso was no longer a minute behind, only a few odd seconds. And he was very well in that mix, although not on track, but within five odd seconds of George Russell fighting for a top six position. I think that's that's a good performance. It might be track specific, sure. But how would you interpret the way that we can? I mean, every result eventually ends up being track specific. That's how I always see it, right? But I think this was a very, very important Fernando Alonso weekend. He qualified again out of position, right? <laughs> he did that in Bahrain and then he's like, our qualifying shouldn't be the basis for where should we should finish in the race. He went backwards, right? But in Saudi Arabia, he qualified and he finished the race out of position, I would say. And uh, I think the car, Aston Martin just, you know, it prefers this track, like you're saying, track specific. But it's a joy to watch Fernando Alonso. He was actually... Doing his thing, doing you know, he was he was in his own race, running qualifying laps, as he kept saying. He showed us how to kiss a wall but not break the car and end up in the barrier. Something that Lance Stroll, I don't even know if I call it a rookie mistake, because a rookie like Oliver Behrman didn't make that mistake. <laughs> so calling it a rookie mistake is probably a bad thing. But Lance Stroll kisses the wall, hits it hard, well, that's fine. But the strange thing, Samuel, he kept his hand on that steering wheel. I mean, you learn this. You learn this in go karts that you take your hands off if you're going for the walls. You learn this through all of your junior formula. And this is a driver who actually had a wrist injury just this time last year, or you know, whatever, thirteen months ago, if I have to be specific. Yeah, yeah. Uh, again, I think you know you need someone to tell you how difficult it is to drive a Formula One car. When all of your friends come in and watch Formula 1 with you, they go like, hey, it's so easy to drive a Formula 1 car. You need a reference to tell you how actually tough it is to drive a car like that, around circuits like that, on the absolute limit. Thank God for Lance Stroll, who helped save all of us in front of all of our friends whenever they ask, hey, it's just like driving in circles, right? He is the perfect reference to use about what would happen if a rookie like us gets into a Formula 1 car. The only difference is he's been doing it for, what, eight years now? I like that. Whatever. Something. Some random number of years. And he's going to continue doing it for a long time. But courtesy of Lance Stroll, we actually have the radio message of the season already. We will talk about it in the awards (laughs) episode. Can you bring it back, Lance? That's what his race engineer said when Lance said, I hit the wall. Okay, and of course, the, the I'm sure the race engineer was looking at a lot of data and not looking at the, the speedometer or the GPS trace where the car had just stopped. You know, the dot which says STR has just stopped on track. Yeah. And Lance, of course, had a few expletives to throw at him. Yeah, amazing. I, I love it. I love it. Uh, but the last thing we need to talk about at the end of this episode is probably the last driver who finished the race in the proper manner, Daniel Ricciardo. Netflix would like you to believe that he is literally the one vying for P2 in the championship because he could throw Sergio Perez out theoretically and get that second Red Bull car. However, a spin at the end of the race, nowhere close to being the Yuki Sonoda in qualifying, the race pace also being dismal. And I remember us having this discussion before we started the recording canal about what's up with Alpha T- uh, nah, Fatari, come on. What's up with racing bulls uh, in general? And now that we decoded the race, we got to know that Yuki Tsunoda's race was probably hindered artificially by that Kevin Magnussen move. But Daniel Ricciardo's terrible race was organic. What went wrong there? Well, what do you see happening? Because I looked through his interviews, tried to read through all the data. I couldn't find much apart from just being naturally slow. And that sucks. 
Yeah, especially for a driver as talented as Ricardo, eight-time Grand Prix winner, somebody who could take Max Verstappen just before he was, you know, reaching his prime, etc. Uh, firstly, Daniel Ricardo hit the curb too hard and he just spun around all by himself. And, you know, strangely, all his interviews, he's been saying, I've been there. I know what it takes to get there. We don't have that yet. I'm trying to build that on. So he's suddenly banking a lot on his experience and that smile to get him through. Truth be told, as as I said on the Wireplay broadcast yesterday, this is Red Bull, right? They take the first seven, eight, maybe six, maybe 10 races to decide the driver's fate for the second half of the year and for 2025. At this rate, Yuki Tsunoda has definitely outshone Daniel Ricciardo in the first two races of the season. Could it even be, forget Red Bull racing in 2025, will they bring in Liam Lawson in place of Daniel Ricciardo somewhere mid-season? It'll be a heartbreak of a move, given how popular Ricciardo is. But hey, popularity, uh, you know, if it made you quick on track, we would have had 20 really popular personalities or, uh, in Formula One, yeah. trying to out personify, out personalityify. Uh, you know, if that's a silly word, I can make each other. You know, I would like that. Let, let's just dip into the hypothetical for a second. Can you imagine Formula One being kind of like Big Brother or Big Boss if you're Indian, where twenty My of goodness. the most notorious and the most uh, colorful people in the world would come together, and instead of fighting over stupid challenges. They would actually fight over racing. Can you imagine? Tom Cruise in one car, Rihanna in the other one, uh, Lewis Hamilton in one, of course. And who else? Brad Pitt. Brad Pitt. Oh, but, ah, see, that's a smart move. That's a good call. Or Saif Ali Khan because Tara Rampam and Ritik Roshan because he's also driven a Formula 3 car on the road once. It's crazy. Would have been Has fun. He? I don't even know what these Hindi Bollywood references are, but... Either way, I have one reference though. Oh, There's maybe. one team that has made sure that at least once every race in 2024, we have a data set of two races and it's happened in both races, they will have an absurdly long pit stop with the other driver. <laughs> in Bahrain, it was Valtteri Bottas. In Saudi Arabia, Joe Guan Yu. No prizes for guessing who the slow pit stop could be, if at all, in Australia for the Sauber Formula One team. And it's embarrassing. It's honestly embarrassing, no? Like, the way... I don't know. Uh, it's sad that we bring this up towards the end of this episode because it's a depressing way to end. But, yeah, if, if Audi really is to turn this team into a winner, there's a long way to go, no? And and it is actually now a 100% Audi team. So, for all the rumors that Audi will come, go, not go, not commit, commit enough, commit less, for one whole year before they were supposed to buy a 100% stake in Sauber they've actually gone ahead and made the purchase. So they have shown a statement of intent uh, when it comes to putting down the money and getting the team that they really want to get. Now it's just about Andrea Seidel and whoever else is working in the background, turning the wake up and saying, this is not an Audi level performance that we expect. And this is definitely not the Sauber as we remember as well. I remember cheering for Sauber Always because they were the best underdog team with some of the best drivers, you know, Kimi Raikkonen, Felipe Massa and, and you know, even uh, Charles Leclerc for that matter, right? So they've sort of drifted away and I really want them to come back to being who we always love for them to be, which is Sauber. Sauber, yeah, exactly. But folks, we'll be back with more for the Australian GP preview in a short bit as well. And thank you so much for watching and listening to this episode of the Inside Line F1 podcast. You know what to do in case you like an episode, right? I won't teach you all of that, but make sure you subscribe to the podcast, share this episode with all your friends and family members who might be interested as well. But don't share it to DC. Don't share this episode to DC. Share another one because we have spoken far too much about things that we don't agree with him on this one. But folks, thank you for listening. We'll be back shortly. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of the Inside Line F1 podcast. Before we ended, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to Amazon Music once again for partnering with us on this episode of the podcast.